Foreshortening is basically this idea where your point of view on the human figure makes part of the human figure appear shorter than it actually is, okay? So you could say, all right, we all know that your average person has limbs, arms, and legs, and those tend to be some of the longer parts of the human figure. But the thing is, an image like this, you can see because of the point of view, the arm, all of a sudden, it looks really weird and short. So if you look at this, like his arm isn't actually that short. It's actually much longer than that. Like, let me illustrate to you guys huh, how much longer his arm actually is in real life. So if you look at him from above, he's in bed, I'm above. <laughs> this is how long his arm is in real life. And yet in the previous photo of him also half naked holding a gun, his arm looks very, very short. So foreshortening is really this strange phenomenon that happens with the human figure. And you can't really avoid it because at a certain point, a figure is gonna stand in some position which does foreshorten some part of the figure to a certain degree. Now, the thing about foreshortening is that sometimes it can be really dramatic looking, like here, okay? Basically, <laughs> Killmonger is about to kill me right now. <laughs> he's got his spear and he's like aiming it right at my face. So anytime you have foreshortening, it's a really good way to show drama and action and movement. And so you guys will notice that foreshortening oftentimes it's associated with really like dynamic poses. Okay. So usually when people are like taking a nap, <laughs> like you're not really seeing a lot of foreshortening because it's not quite as dramatic. And so here you have this really weird position because Killmonger is looking at us and his chest looks pretty average. Well, it's up for all the, you know, scars on top of it. But if you look at this, like the arm looks really bizarre. And so this is why I think a lot of people struggle with foreshortening because they don't really know what to do with it. And I have to say more often than not, I tend to hear people complain about foreshortening then talk about ways they can really use it to their advantage. So you guys who are watching right now, tell me in the chat, is foreshortening something that frustrates you? Like when you see something that's foreshortened in a figure, do you run screaming in the other direction? Or do you say, ooh, cool, awesome, foreshortening? Because I know for some people, it just feels endlessly frustrating. And a lot of people don't really know how to use it and they worry, oh no, it looks so weird. Well, I'm gonna teach you guys different ways you can actually get foreshortened to work for you. So you're not just like endlessly frustrated all the time. Now, another reason you might wanna do foreshortening in addition to all the dynamic angles and all the action and stuff like that is that foreshortening is a really good way in the context of the human figure to show depth. And that's not really something that a lot of people think about because I think oftentimes when people think about depth and space in regards to the human figure, they tend to think about backgrounds. And sure, that's important, but you can use foreshortening to really push the sense of depth in your image. W315 is saying part of the limb is always blurry. How do I draw blurry? Well, I think it depends, again, on your reference photo and what you're really after and stuff like that. If it's blurry, you have to say to yourself, maybe there's a reason why it's blurry. Like usually things that are blurrier, they tend to fall back into the space. So depends on the photo. Obviously here, the hand that's closest to us is actually very blurry because we're too busy looking at his face, right? At least I am. And so you do have to think about that. If you were to take your own reference photos, depending on where you decide to focus the camera, that can really change the way things come out. Slepnir is saying foreshortening is something to work at and utilize. Seven Angelic says foreshortening is so hard, but so dynamic. Yeah, like basically with foreshortening, if you guys can get it to work for you, it's like you're going to be unstoppable as a figurative artist because you can do amazing things with foreshortening that honestly you're just not going to get with any other situation. Okay, so here's how you show depth. For example, Magneto's face 
is so far away from me. Okay, so I, I'm feeling, I'm feeling that distance between me and Michael. Okay. On the other hand, though, his hand is very close to me. I mean, granted, he's pointing a gun at me, which I don't really like that much. But hey, you know, I'll take what I can get. I'm in the same room as him. That's fine. <laughs> you know. So that's the basic idea: is that if you have something that's foreshortened, there's a very dramatic amount of physical space between where his face is and where his hand actually is. Blue Wolf Spirit is saying even a finger pointing at you can be foreshortened. They're an example in the hand draw along. And this is a good point from David. They're saying it would also depend on how much rendering you're going to do. Yeah, I mean, stylistically speaking, you might decide that you really want everything to be blurry. So there's no real rules about how you should do foreshortening. I just think there's certain things that you guys can pivot to your advantage more that maybe a lot of people don't consider. Okay. Another thing that foreshortening does as well is it really emphasizes point of view, okay? For example, if I'm in the scene and I love this trench coat, he looks so good in this trench coat. Oh my God, I mean, there's nothing he doesn't look good in, but I just, I really like this trench coat. So anyway, if I'm in the scene and his arm is foreshortened and it's pointing at me, he's pointing the gun at me. Like, why is he doing that? Actually, in the scene, he's such a jerk in the scene. Like, he was all cool with Mystique. And then he decided that because they were going to take her blood and use it as power against the mutants that he was going to kill her. Like, you're such a jerk, Magneto. You're a hot though, so that's fine. <laughs> or if you think about this, okay? Here we have foreshortening, not in the arm, but actually you have foreshortening in the face, okay? So because the face is pointing upwards and that's where we're getting our foreshortening, I don't know why, but I'm in a dirt hole in Japan with Wolverine, okay? That's not really what I envisioned, Hugh, but again, I'll take it, you know? I, I can lower my standards just for you. That's totally fine. We have a question from Raw Nook. They're saying, does linear perspective, I'm guessing that's what you're saying, have any role in understanding for shortening? Not really, if you're talking about linear perspective, because the thing about linear perspective is that it's a geometric system and the human figure is not a bunch of cubes. And also depending on where the arm is pointing, it probably does not line up with the vanishing point and stuff like that. So I think that fundamentally it is the same idea, which is that, okay, things that are further away from you, far away in the distance tend to look smaller. Things that are closer to you tend to look bigger. But yeah, as far as like actually implementing it mechanically into an image, they're not really related at all. Okay. Now here's the thing you guys really have to accept about foreshortening. It looks weird, okay? It's the weirdest looking thing, okay? See, you guys thought this was about hot white men. Actually, there's a couple of hot black men in here as well. But I did sneak in some art history, okay? I'm, I'm gonna make you guys learn some art history. You didn't even know you were gonna get it, and I'm sorry, you're just gonna have to listen now because you're here. So Paul Cadmus, he's actually an artist who I really think is severely underappreciated. And he did these just beautiful male nude drawings. Most of them are cross-hatched images. And I have to say, when I was like big into cross-hatching many years ago, I really spent a lot of time looking at his drawings and he does very strange foreshortened figures. So if you guys have not seen Paul Cadmus before, definitely look him up. He's done a lot of oil paintings, like figurative pieces and stuff, but I actually like his drawings more because I feel like his drawings have a certain rigor in the marks that I feel gets lost in his paintings, but that's just my personal opinion. But guys, look at how weird that leg is. And it's like, if the leg looks like that, like you can't even try to normalize it. Like, what is that supposed to mean? Like people always say to me, well, it looks so weird. I'm like, of course it looks weird, okay? It's going to look weird. Like you could take the most accurate photo and it would still look weird. So here's what you guys have to do when you do foreshortening, accept that it's going to look weird. And once you guys do that, you're gonna be home free. Because <laughs> honestly, that's like half the battle is people just, being like, oh, it looks weird, okay, that's okay. 
all right. <laughs> like that's the thing that a lot of people really have trouble with. So here we've got this leg, which I don't know. I, he looks like he's wearing like tights or something. I can't actually tell what the figure is wearing, but it's like, it doesn't even look like it belongs in that body. Like, especially when you look at the foreshortened leg compared to the leg on the right hand side, it's just a really bizarre image. So this is what I think. If Paul Cadmus can do these weirdo figures and make awesome drawings, it's totally cool with everybody, okay? I like this comment from Tom G. That's a relief. Now I can just say my drawing isn't bad. It's just for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. That reminds me of the one thing I retained from high school chemistry was my teacher was trying to explain what entropy was. And so he said that every time his living room was a mess and his wife complained, he would say, it's entropy. So th there's, we've got our own excuse now. We can just, it's foreshortened. Yeah, totally. I love that. Like guys, look at, okay, this one's even weirdo. Okay, you guys thought Paul Cadmus was weird. Okay, Pontormo, he made the strangest figures. Okay, if you guys have not looked at Pontormo, or looked at the Mannerists, this is the weirdest movement on the planet because first of all, it came after the Renaissance. And so it has somewhat of the formality of the Renaissance, but for some reason, everybody in a Mannerist drawing and painting looks like really worried. <laughs> they all look really anxious. They have really strange proportions. The heads are always too small. And then you add foreshortening on top of that, you end up with these like really whack, figures. So if you guys want to feel like your figures are very normal and fine, just look upon Torma, you will feel so incredibly normal as a figurative artist. I mean, like, what is going on, Pontorma? Like, what are you doing? I just think this is the weirdest drawing. So if you guys can let these look weird, I think it's going to be a lot better. Alison Wonderland is saying, how do you keep figures from looking stiff when foreshortening? My figures look incredibly rigid when I try. Well, I'd have to look at your drawing to give you an accurate answer, but I suspect that part of it, you probably are not overlapping the forms. And so that is a basic approach that I'm gonna go over later. So I would just pay attention to that because I think foreshortening, it looks weird, but there is a logic to the way it's structured. So I'm gonna break that down for you guys so that makes a little bit more sense. Ron Nux says, do we have a stream or reading you suggest where we compare different art domains like drawing versus painting? What value does drawing hold as compared to oil paintings? Wow, that, that's like a whole other YouTube channel, Ron Nux. So <laughs> we will definitely get to that at some point. Okay, guys, this to me, See, you guys thought you were going to look at Michael Fassbender and Chadwick Boseman, but no, you're you're actually learning art history today. Is that incredible? <laughs> I just love it when I, it, it's sort of like when you sneak vegetables into your kids' <laughs> foods. Or I don't actually do that. I've always thought that was the weirdest thing that people say they do that. But anyway, this to me, this is like the quintessential foreshortened figure in the whole universe. Okay, this is Andrea Montaigne's Renaissance painting called The Dead Christ. This is a weird painting, you guys. Like on every single level, it's just so bizarre. Like the proportions are so weird. We don't know what's going on with the shoulders. Look at that rib cage, the way it's like, I don't know. I find this to be just one of the most bizarre figurative paintings out there. And then on top of that, it's not just the figure. Do you guys see how actually that the drapery that's on top of the legs, that actually does play into the foreshortening because you show the layer upon the layer of the drapery that then leads you backwards into the space up to the head. So if you guys have not had a chance to really take a hard look at this painting, I would, because this to me is one of the weirdest paintings. Yeah, so like for example here, Lisa is saying the head seems too big everything is messed up in this painting, guys. Like there's the single thing in here that is remotely, quote, accurate. And even that, it's like, you, you can't hold on to anything. Like for example, BV here is saying, is it just me? Do the feet look super tiny? 
And Neil is saying the point of view is also weird. It's like we're toddler sized. And W315 says the head is too big. And Seven Angelic says the women on the side look weird too. Yeah. So it's like everything's weird. Okay. <laughs> like don't try to fix it. Okay. Let's just have weird feet, weird cloth, weird chest, weird head. It's fine. Like as long as you guys accept that as part of the process and you embrace that that is really going to work out for you, I think, artistically. Okay, so here's the thing. A lot of people, they get really stressed about the foreshortening looking right, whatever that's supposed to be. And I think that's a anatomy thing in general. I don't think that's just foreshortening. I think a lot of people do obsess about, oh, well, something doesn't quite look right about that arm or something about the chest is like perfect and awesome and taut. <laughs> So there's that part of it that I think comes with anatomy anyway, which is why when I think people try to make foreshortening look right, it's not going to happen, guys. You're just not going to. You have to accept that the foreshortening is just going to mess things up for you in general. And so make sure that happens. I love this comment here from Super 7 Kevin. Clara's personality, humor, art experience, plus art history, the fun art history class we all deserve. Seriously, why does art history have to be so freaking dry and boring? Please explain that to me. Like, there's so much cool stuff about art history. I just don't understand why it has that reputation. It does not have to be that way. So here's the thing, you guys. Like, if you really want to do all that measuring and you want to be accurate, you're going to have to do poses like this. <laughs> like, you're not going to be able to do anything remotely dynamic because the only time things really look correct are when people aren't doing anything fun and exciting with their figures. So I would recommend you guys just throw out that whole accuracy thing because it's only going to limit you and it's just going to be you getting all worked up about something that honestly is not really that important. All right. Here's the other thing. I know a lot of people when they're doing anatomy get very concerned about proportions. And we probably will do a stream about proportions at some point because I do talk a lot about proportions and not wanting to do all of those measurements. But I feel like I need to spend some time like really targeting that. But basically, I do think about proportions. I think the difference is that I train my eye to look at scale relationships. So I say, how big is the arm? compared to the chest, how wide is the waist compared to the shoulders? I will do stuff like that, okay? I'm not as precise as, say, Loomis and stuff like that. But the thing is, you guys, the second you get foreshortening, the proportions go out the window, okay? <laughs> like, any amount of how big is the, you can't do it. Like, come on, guys, this is a cool photo, okay? Because actually, it's weird. When I was searching for photos for the stream, it actually was a little bit hard to do because a lot of movie posters tend to be very straight on and very much in the center because they like to make things look a little bit bolder. And so I was like freaking out when I saw this photo because I was like, oh my God, this is like the quintessential example of just crazy whack foreshortening that's just messing with all the proportions. Like, look at this, you guys, okay? Wolverine, I know your claws are long. But they're not that long, and they are definitely not longer than your upper torso. But it's because of the angle and the foreshortening that makes it appear to be that way. So this is a weird point of view. It's like I am maybe five years old, and I'm looking up at Wolverine, but I'm also at a side view. Like it's a very particular point of view and height that I'm looking at him with. So I don't know. It's, it's really funny. Like why is it? five-year-old hanging out with Wolverine. I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> He's got his like claws out like that. Like that's really not such a good idea. So this is what you have to do with foreshortening. You can't rely on proportional systems. You have to rely on your eyes. You have to really observe. You got to train yourself to see those shapes, to see those relationships. It's the only way you can do it. Okay. Also, Come on, guys, this is a sweet center line. Like, I was looking at this, I was like, okay, I know it's a foreshortening stream, but this is kind of an awesome center line. So let's just kick back and admire it for a few seconds and 
I'll remind you that the center line is important for educational reasons, stuff like that. But anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Now, the funny thing about foreshortening, which I think a lot of people don't realize, is that you can have foreshortening on a very small scale. Like you can totally have foreshortening contained to just a finger. Like you can have a foreshortened finger and it can be very subtle. It does not have to be that dramatic. Like here the foreshortening, it's visible, but it's not like blatantly obvious the way it is in some of the other photos. But on the other hand, you can also foreshorten like the whole body. Okay, so you can think about a lot of the examples I showed earlier, it was a foreshortened arm. But if you think about the body just as one big arm, you can foreshorten the whole thing, in which case stuff gets really, really weird looking <laughs> because uh, I don't know about you guys, but I just saw a mushroom. I was like, T'Challa, you look like a mushroom. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, I don't even know how I got this shot. Like I never watched the Avengers movies, but I knew he was in them. So I was like, okay, I think I ran through like all the half naked Black Panther photos. I was like, okay, I need to start dipping into Avengers. And I found this shot. I was like, so excited because he totally looks like a mushroom. Like doesn't his chest look like a mushroom cap? And then it's so weird the way his legs just come out of nowhere. Like let's just skip over the thighs and knees entirely. Like it's just the weirdest thing in the world. Oh my gosh, this is, so, I, I have to show this comment. W315 says, Wolverine is a terrible babysitter, really not good at changing diapers. What what if he was like really good at it though? Like what if he, he had like extra like sharp knives and could, you know, get through all those safety pins really quickly? Who knows? <laughs> all right. Now, okay, more art history. <laughs> if you guys are being crucified upside down, you're going to have a foreshortened torso. What a horrible way to exist. <laughs> Poor St. Peter was not just crucified, but crucified upside down. And this is a remarkable painting. If you guys are ever in Rome, you should go to this one church. It's got the St. Matthew um, series by Caravaggio. And this is a remarkable painting. So if you guys look at this, you see the blue arrow that shows the foreshortening in the torso, but it doesn't stop there because there's foreshortening like buried in all these little spots in this painting. Like I actually think the feet in this painting are amazing. And the thing is like, whatever amount of amazing you think they are from the slides are even better in real life. Like the dirty feet on the lower right hand corner. Okay. The foot on the right, that's a profile, but the one that has like dirt caked on the heel, that one is foreshortened. If you look at St. Peter's feet on the left-hand side, you have the nails that are digging into the feet. I mean, those are really dramatically foreshortened. So the thing is, you guys, foreshortening is everywhere. And I do think it's similar to anatomy in that to identify muscles, you have to learn what they look like, where to look for them. And I think same thing with foreshortening. You have to know when to keep an eye out for it, learn how to recognize it, and then really learn how to push its best talents going across. Okay, now here's another guarantee that there's gonna be foreshortening. The, the couple situations, you guys, where you're probably gonna have foreshortening, okay? So anytime Magneto uses his powers, there's probably gonna be foreshortening, guys. Dark Phoenix is such a bad movie. This is a clip from Dark Phoenix. It was so bad, but I love the scene. Oh my God. The scene is like, oh, they play this like awesome music and he's such a badass. Anyway, it was worth it sitting through that like horrible movie just for this like 30 second clip because I could just like oh, watch this as a gif on my computer like all day long and totally be cool with that. So anyway, look for it when he uses his powers there's probably going to be foreshortening going on. For example, here, he's got his foreshortened arm because he's like creaking up a train and all these aliens just got murdered and stuff like that. And at once in a while, okay, he uses his powers and there's no foreshortening. So like in this image, you do see the full length of his arm. Okay, so there are exceptions to this, okay? I'll admit though, the only reason I put this in was because I just, oh, he looks so good in a fedora. I just like wanna die. So just needed to find a way to put the slide in there. And so the thing about foreshortening, it's, it's the appearance 
of things looking shorter. It's not that something actually is shorter, it's just foreshortening. And that's really what it comes down to. Okay, so let's do some comparisons. So you guys can see really visibly what some of the differences are. Okay, so this is just a plain photo from the Art Prof reference collection, which I hope you guys are really enjoying because I've been having a lot of fun putting together those images for you guys. Now, if you look at this, this is almost the same view of the hand, but you can see because the hand is on the ground, the point of view that we are looking at that hand at has changed, okay? So two things have changed. The fingers look shorter and also the palm looks a lot shorter, okay? So just those two things alone, it changes. And you think about, okay, well, what did the hand do? At first the hand was doing this and now the hand is doing this, okay? So that's a shift of positioning that changes the foreshortening very visibly in the hand. Okay, now you're all wondering, like, why do you have this like dirty hand? Well, <laughs> you know, in Apocalypse, when <laughs> Magneto's like destroying everything, of course I needed to use some of those clips for sure. Also guys, I would pretty much bet anytime you watch a movie and there's a weapon, there's probably some amount of foreshortening. So if you are, hopefully not watching Assassin's Creed because it's the most terrible movie. I could not get through it. There's probably foreshortening or if somebody's picking up a beer because they're about to murder these two guys or if you're at the Supper of Emmaus. <laughs> this is actually the most ridiculous painting. I'm sorry, Caravaggio. I love you to death and I think you're amazing and I do have an inferior complex that I developed over many years because I saw your paintings in real life. But this, I don't know why this painting annoys me. You know what it is? This is such a like show off painting. This is Caravaggio like basically saying, look what I can do. And we're all like, screw you, you're so annoying. <laughs> like just cause you can paint like beautiful drapery and like incredible dramatic angles doesn't mean you have to like rub it in our face. So anyway, there's actually another version of the same story, Supper at Emmaus, that Caravaggio did many, many years later that I really think is remarkable. So look at the two versions because this is Caravaggio, like, this is like freshman Caravaggio. Like he's like in here to like one up everybody. And then he gets all like wise later on. So look at the other one. And you can see here, there's a lot of foreshortening throughout this entire painting. But I would say the one that really leaps out to me is the one by the green arrow because it's got this like weird slant to it. And it's not just that, like, look at this guy, okay? This guy, I don't know why he's doing this. He's got his arms outstretched. I'm like, who does that at the dinner table? I think it's such a weird gesture. But it's like, think about how far back in space his other hand is and the way this one just lunges forward and look at the clothing that's around his sleeve. Like, doesn't that remind you guys of the dead Christ with the drapery around the figure? So drapery can definitely, I think, also enhance what is going on at the same time. This is interesting. A lot of conversation here about the fruit bowl. Trent says, supposedly the fruit bowl was there to make people get more involved, okay? And looks like Caravaggio did a number on you, 10K, because they are saying, is anyone else craving a nice juicy pear and some chicken right now? That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, although Calm Cuke says he's summoning <laughs> all of Carmen Waitress for more breads. That, that, okay, that is definitely the narrative I am gonna to apply to this painting from now on, because that's the only way you can explain this ridiculous gesture that this guy is doing. Okay, and by the way, you guys, like I could not believe the news about Chadwick Boseman because like I'm not the type of person who gets that upset when celebrities die. Like, I mean, it's sad and everything, but this like, this was just so heartbreaking. Like you think about he was filming all those movies when he was so ill, like I just could not believe it. And they were such like physically demanding movies. Like, oh my God, this just like broke my heart when he passed away. It's like such a shock for so many people. So thank you, Chadwick, for holding the scary looking weapon so we can see the foreshortening and you're like perfectly chiseled arms. Like, oh my God, it just makes me like so, 
sad when I think about this. So yeah. All right, so we have the foreshortening in T'Challa's beautifully chiseled arm. And foreshortened heads are really weird, guys. They drive people up the wall, okay? You thought drawing just a portrait <laughs> was hard? Try drawing a foreshortened head. That gets very, very dicey. We probably should do a stream, draw along just on foreshortened heads alone, because that certainly, I think, would be really, really good to do. So foreshortened head, basically, if you see that, what that's an indication of is that you're either above the figure, in this case, Chadwick Boseman is down because he got hit by somebody in the Avengers. I feel like I want to go back and like watch all those movies now because I never bothered watching the Avengers. And I'm just like, oh my God, I feel like I need to go back and do that. Or you were looking up at the figure. Okay, so it's very dramatic. So if you're just like looking at somebody eye to eye, that's just straight on, you're not gonna get any foreshortening, okay? But if you're Magneto and you just got infused with all this extra mutant energy and you are destroying the world, this is what happens. You end up with a very foreshortened head. Neil is asking, any tips on drawing foreshortened heads from a mirror? You probably could have a lot of fun, Neil, using two mirrors. Because if you play with the angles and you like tweak a little here and tweak a little there, I have been able to set up mirrors so that I could actually draw a perfect profile of myself from a mirror. It, it takes time though. I mean, it's not easy to do and you'll get really frustrated in the process of trying to set up the mirrors, but it's worth it. I mean, it's really, really cool. Some of the stuff that you guys can get. Okay. <laughs> Kate, I'm so glad you appreciate all the hard work I put into my slide lectures. Kate is saying there are some really hard to find references. Well, you know, when you have to um, screenshot stuff from YouTube, you, you, you got to make sure you get just the right pose. I would not want you guys to have a pose that misleads you. So I got to work really hard to find just the right one. Okay, so when you have a foreshortened head, what that basically means is that the facial features, they get squished. They do this, <laughs> basically. It's like if you took a marshmallow and just went like that. That's basically what would happen with a foreshortened head. And so that's why they look so bizarre. Other circumstances when you might have a foreshortened head. For example, if you're St. Teresa and you're in the middle of an ecstasy. Who here has seen the sculpture? or knows about this sculpture. Because I love Bernini, okay? I think he's a phenomenal, amazing sculptor. And I saw so much of his stuff when I was in Europe. But you know what? I didn't like the sculpture in real life. Like the photos of it look better. And I feel so bad saying that because in theory, I really like the sculpture. But when I saw it, it just looked like wonton wrappers. Like, I don't know, there's something about the drapery that was not good. I'm like, Bernini, I'm like so incredibly disappointed. I don't know, maybe it was the angle, because sometimes these sculptures are like in these altar areas and it's a little bit hard to see. But anyway, you guys can see in this photo, she's in ecstasy. And so we do have this foreshortened point of view. Or if you're a priest and your two sons are being murdered by serpents because you decided you wanted to throw a spear at the Trojan horse. So there, okay? If you guys don't know the sculpture, this is Leo Kuhn and his sons. And it's actually a sculpture from Hellenistic Greece, which, oh, my favorite ancient movement. Hellenistic Greece, oh my God, greatest thing. If you guys have never seen a Hellenistic Greek sculpture, here's your first one. There's many, many more, but I think the foreshortening in this face is really incredible. Yeah, so you guys thought this was going to be a hot white men's dream, but you're actually gaining all this art history knowledge. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, yeah, Starving Artist is saying, gorgeous sculpture, you don't like it. I didn't like it in person. Now, and you guys tell me this in the chat. For those of you who have seen famous artworks in a book, and then later on you went somewhere, you got to see the real thing. I found that with really famous pieces, 
it was one reaction or another. It was either, oh my God, my head's exploding because I just saw the Sistine Chapel. Or it's like, oh, that's the SSC of St. Teresa. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's, it's really weird. It's like you're either phenomenally disappointed or your head explodes. It's like one or the other. It's very, very strange. Okay. So the other thing about foreshortening that I think really throws people off is with foreshortening, oftentimes there are body parts that just disappear. They're, they're just not there. <laughs> so in this Paul Cadmus drawing, you can see that's basically what happens in this pose is that we just jump from thighs to breasts. It's like, yeah, there's nothing in between. <laughs> like there's no stomach, there's no pelvis. Like we just go from like leg to breast. It's a really abrupt shift when you have foreshortening. I mean, it's so weird looking that if you guys look at the body, I mean, it almost feels like those legs are not connected to the upper section of the body. That's how weird foreshortening can look. Slapnir is saying, I saw a Vermeer in real life and was disappointed. You know what? I was not disappointed, but I couldn't believe how small they were. Like, I was not prepared for how tiny the paintings were. I guess I sort of knew, but you don't really know until you actually see it hanging on the wall. And let's see, Johnny is saying, the Mona Lisa was a letdown. The Mona Lisa, I sort of feel like it's not. Mona Lisa's fault because it's just such a spectacle. Like it's really hard to see it. It's so frustrating. Like I wish it wasn't like that with that piece. Like I really feel bad about the way that it's displayed. Okay, let's take a look at another area where something disappears, okay? So what you will see in foreshortening is these very abrupt leaps from one body part to another that really does not make a lot of sense, okay? So if you look at this view, because we have to bring up the scene again. I love the scene, oh my God. When he takes off his sunglasses, oh, that is, oh, I guess I know what I'm gonna be watching tonight. He has no shoulder. Like, do you guys see the hand is not foreshortened because we're just seeing the palm. But basically you go from like hand to a little piece of the forearm and then that's it. Like there's no shoulder, <laughs> there's nothing. There's no transition. I think that's what people are sometimes not aware of with foreshortening is that there are certain body parts that just get skipped entirely. And so you have to sometimes even deliberately do that. Like you have to say which body part is missing that I would think should be there, but actually is not. And that's what's very, very weird about it. This is interesting. Ra Nook is saying, I guess we make an image of an artwork in our own minds and we compare them with it. And they are also saying, I agree. It's either or never in between. W315 says, honestly, I wouldn't bother with the Mona Lisa if I were going to the Louvre. I don't know if they've moved the Mona Lisa since I was there, probably. I was there in like the 90s. But when I was there, the exact same room as the Mona Lisa, they had Caravaggio's Death of the Virgin. And everybody's like, I'm like, okay, come on. Death of the Virgin, way better than the Mona Lisa. So yeah, there's so many other things that, yeah, that are way better in my opinion. Kate is saying, my friend commissioned a drawing. The entire thing is foreshortening and disappearing limbs. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I just love that. And W315 says those pipes are foreshortened right. I guess so. I mean, I feel like when I look at pipes, I don't think about it the same way because pipes are so mechanical and it's like not as noticeable when things are shortened. But yeah, I mean, that's basically quintessential linear perspective back there, those being foreshortened. Okay. So, okay, this is why I love these pod, pod, Paul Cadmus drawings is that he does like really deliberately choose strange poses. I mean, I don't really know that many other artists that did drawings of male nudes that were this weird. I mean, I feel like actually most of art history, I feel like is all female nudes. So it's actually really nice to see somebody who's like really focusing on the male nude. But look at this. It's like, if you look at the leg on the left, do you guys see how you jump from the kneecap straight to the foot? There's no ankles. There's no shin bone. 
And same thing with the right hand side, you just go thigh foot, like there's no lower leg at all. And so it's that really abrupt leap that is really, really strange looking that people have trouble with, I think a lot of the time. This one's weird. Like, like doesn't this look like there's like a little hat on his left shoulder? Like it's so bizarre. Like, you know, in theory, okay, his back is covering where that right leg should be, but it's just so weird to go from like shoulder right to the upper half of the foot. And I'm convinced that Paul Cadmus did this stuff on purpose. Like, I don't think that you pose your models like this by accident. It's happening in all of his drawings. And so if you guys have not seen his stuff, take a look at it. Cause he's got other images that do not have so much foreshortening, but have beautiful cross hatching. Like I just could like, oh, melt into his crosshatch marks are just so, so beautifully done. Let's see, Trent is saying that right foot would scare me. I always get worried when the limb, hand and foot peeks out just a tiny bit. Well, see, that's what I like about Paul Cadmus is that he doesn't seem to shy away from that. And he seems to really own how weird it is. I mean, his figures are weird looking, like they're not really your classical idealized male figures. There's something a little bit funky about their proportions. And that's why I like his work so much is that I think it is a little bit outside of that idealized classical Greek male figure that you see all the time. Okay, now another thing you guys can do to really help yourselves understand foreshortening. So look for overlaps. And this is not isolated to foreshortening. You should be doing this anyway. I think with all of anatomy, no matter what you're drawing, looking at what form overlaps in front of another one will really help you guys to understand anatomy from a more sculptural point of view. Because the thing is, yes, we're making two dimensional drawings, but ultimately I always like to think about anatomy from the point of view of a sculptor, that I, I really am building form, even though the actual drawing is two dimensional. And so thinking about overlaps, what form is in front of another becomes hugely important in order to get the foreshortening to come across. We have a comment from starving artist, drawing foreshortening is a really weird experience where it looks all wrong when you're drawing it, but so right when you finish and step back or it still looks all wrong and that's okay too. You know what I'm saying? So I think the whole thing about foreshortening is you really have to be on board. <laughs> like, like if you guys are not on board with the weirdness and the strange disappearing shoulders and ankles, like you're just gonna be miserable all the time. So really good for you guys to acknowledge that. Okay, so let's show you guys some of the overlaps that I want you to take a look at. For example, if you look at the calf, okay, I'm gonna go back here so you guys can see it a little bit better. So we have the, the roundness of the calf. That particular muscle is called the gastrocnemius, okay? That calf muscle, it's in front of the thigh. So if I show you guys this, does everybody see how that thigh is behind the overlap of what's happening with the calf? So we have the calf here, and then we have the thigh behind the calf, okay? Now, what a lot of people do is they don't show the overlap, they just trace the contour. But if you trace the contour, you're not understanding the physical arrangement of the forms in relation to each other, which is very much a sculptor's point of view. Because I think when a lot of people just draw two-dimensionally, they don't think about the 3D quality of it, they just trace the outline, and that's when the drawing starts to get really, really flat. Let's see, Komodo is saying the tone paper really goes well with the shading and highlights in this drawing. It looks so good. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure exactly what Paul Cadmus used. I mean, I'm gonna guess that it's like charcoal pencil or something like that because I don't think it's ink, but something charcoal pencil-y would be probably my guess. Maybe one of you guys can look that up at some point because I have not had the chance to do that. Okay, now look at this. Here's another section, okay? You have the shoulder. We have not gone over this muscle yet, but that particular muscle that I've highlighted, it's called the deltoid, okay? So the deltoid is in front of the head. The head is behind the shoulder, okay? 
this would only happen with foreshortening, okay? If this figure stood up and was standing upright, nothing would be in front of anything. It's like this because it's foreshortened. So really foreshortening, it's like this series of forms that's like lined up in front of another and you have to start to really see where those overlaps are. Okay, let's take a look here. So the foot in this case, it's in front of the leg. And again, like some of the other images, that foot almost looks like it's not really attached. It, it almost looks like somebody cut it out and just like tacked it onto the drawing. There's that awkwardness again that starts to happen. Ron Nook is asking, can we do in crayons what Cadmus is doing here? You probably will not be able to get that level of line that he gets. If you guys look up some of his drawings and you find some high resolution photographs, you will see some of his drawings have very, very refined cross hatching. I don't think it's a quill pen or anything like that, but my guess is that a crayon might be a little bit too blunt to get that level of precision that he has in his cross hatching. Trent says, I found a Cadmus page on DC Moore Gallery. Looks like these are from colored crayons on toned paper. Some are also tempera. Cool. Thank you so much for doing some of that research. I feel like I have like a research team here to help me out. <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, guys, look at Paul Cadmus. It's like, it just bums me out. Like there's so many like really awesome artists that just for one reason or another, people have not looked at them and it bums me out big time. Okay. So if you think about it, foreshortening as a series of overlaps, that will give you guys the opportunity to really break down the structure of foreshortening, okay? And, and this is separate from all the bone and muscle stuff, okay? It's related, but it's not quite exactly the same thing. So I think somebody had said earlier in the chat that their foreshortened images tended to look a little bit stiff. I think this is what's going to change it, is this way of seeing the overlap and really, really trying to exaggerate it and push it as you possibly can. Because so much of anatomy, you have to have the awareness of what it is you're looking for. Then you need to be able to find it. You got to locate it in the figure. And then you have to push it, okay? It's not just enough to say, oh, I know where that is. Like, you really have to have it be in your mindset as an artist. So that's something you really want to push in your drawing. Okay. So everybody look at this. All right. We have T'Challa. Oh God. I really, <laughs> I wanted to put him in the stream because of course, like everybody's thinking about his passing and everything. And that was just like making me really sad. So anyway, we're going to look at his hand. Okay. So that's the closest object to us. And you can see, I, I just sort of quickly traced with a purple line. So you can see, okay, that's about the mass of where that hand is. Now look at this, you guys. The forearm, which I highlighted in yellow, it really is behind the hand, okay? Now that's what happens in foreshortening, okay? If this arm was just stretched out, you know, in that photo of Michael Fassbender naked in a bed, <laughs> I'm just gonna think about that every time I need to make that comparison. You have the forearm behind the hand. That, that's the concept of foreshortening. One thing is in front of another. They're not just lined up next to each other. One thing's in front, okay? And then, does everybody see how the shoulder, the deltoid muscle that I mentioned earlier, that is behind the forearm, okay? So look at this, we have hand, which is in front of the forearm, which is in front of the shoulder. So already we have three forms that are lined up and overlapped in front of each other, okay? That is a quintessential foreshortened structure for you guys to look at. 10,000 Crow says, I started drawing for the 2,500 challenge. Awesome. Hope some of you guys are doing that. Let me know in the chat if you guys are doing the 2,500 and how it's going. Some of you guys have been at it for a while, which is phenomenal. And 10K says, it made me realize I have so much to learn. You know what? That's good, 10K, because what that says is that you're now starting to see things in your drawings and the references that maybe you were not seeing before. And like I said, you guys, so much of anatomy is learning how to identify what it is that you're looking at, okay? All right, so we have these three. And then look at this, you have the chin that's behind the shoulder. Guys, I have to also notice 
my graphic design here. Does everybody see hand so much bigger? You move backwards into space, things get smaller and smaller. <laughs> I know I have way too much fun on Google Slides. Like I could just spend days just changing colors and moving arrows around. Like I don't know why I find it so incredibly satisfying. Well, when you add hot white men, it really <laughs> it's just like the best combination ever. So does everybody see this sequence that's happening? Hand, forearm, shoulder, chin. This really is about depth. It's about pushing back into the distance and things overlapping in front of each other. So if you think about that, in my opinion, it makes foreshortening seem less mysterious because I do think foreshortening can just look strange and you can just throw your arms and say, ah, whatever. But you can think about it more analytically and structurally if that's what you want to do. We have a comment from Vincent who is saying, when I'm doing a foreshortened drawing, I always start rendering that part because it's the hardest part. So if I messed it up, I could just start with another work and move on. Well, what I recommend people do, especially with anatomy in the human figure, is to work everything. Don't just work one section because the whole thing about the human figure that's tricky is that ultimately it is one form. I mean, you can subdivide the human figure into all these different pieces and parts, but I think the key to getting all those parts to work is to develop them at the same rate. So try not to isolate certain parts of the figure. You really wanna have everything developing cohesively all at the same time. So with the foreshortening, if you know it's gonna look weird, you know you have no shot <laughs> of making it look normal, this is what I think. And you guys are gonna think I'm nuts for actually suggesting this. I think you should exaggerate it more. Okay, I know that sounds crazy because you're like, okay, figure already looks whack. Why would I wanna make it more whack? Well, because I think it's more expressive. And if you guys want a photo, just get a photo. <laughs> it's a lot faster. So typically what I do is if I notice that there's foreshortening in a pose and I'm trying to do it, whatever is in the distance, I'll actually visibly try to make it smaller, okay? Now, Montaigne, the guy that did the dead Christ image, he was just messing with you guys. He's like, I don't care where this is located in space. I'm just going to screw with the proportions and whatever, okay? But this is another way to do it, is to say, you know what? Let's give that foreshortening another extra push, make the hand in the distance a little bit smaller, and then make the objects in the foreground even bigger. So it's a little bit ridiculous. When you look at this Wolverine photo, because the two hands are insanely different in terms of scale. I mean, it looks like the front hand is like three times the size of the hand in the back, but come on, it's Wolverine. Of course you want to do something like that. Like why would you want to water down what's happening in the scene, right? It's always dramatic. And so if you guys don't know, we do have this art prof reference photo collection. It's totally free. It's high quality resolution photos that I shot with my DSLR. And my intent is to keep adding to it. You guys know I have 10,000 things to do, but I am trying to slowly build up this collection. And so it's on Flickr. The link is in the video description below. It's also in the Discord. Guys, I'm very excited. I took these weird <laughs> foreshortened hand reference photos. They're actually in their own album in Flickr and you guys are gonna look at these and you're gonna be like, oh God, Clara, what are you doing? You're gonna make me draw this on site. Yes, yes, I'm gonna make you draw these bizarre poses that I contorted myself into all in the name of art education, okay? So I took actually a lot of them, I deleted a whole bunch because a lot of them were not very good, but I tried to really create poses that would really push the idea of that layering the overlapping, the strange point of view. So if you guys got an opportunity, take a look at that collection. I think there's like 30 new photos in there. And then probably what I'll do for the draw along on Sunday, I will post in the Discord the specific reference photos that we're gonna be using. So that way you guys can download them and have them available because th this is gonna be a tough drawing stream in that you guys are gonna be drawing these hands. You're gonna be like, Clara, this looks like a mar a garbled like vulture hand. Like it's just gonna look really weird. But it's like, I think that 
that's a great way for you guys to stretch your drawing muscles because even if ultimately you don't want to do these strange, weird hands, at least you've had the experience. Like you, you know what that is and you can make a choice whether that's your cup of tea or not. It, it really is up to you. Thank you so much for the super chat, 10,000 crows. Always appreciate your support. Thank you guys so much for doing that for us. And let's see, Eric Lee, I'm so glad you're on board. All in the name of art education for sure. Yeah, and uh, looks like Komodo Dragon, not 100% on board <laughs> for for sure on hands that look like vulture fingers. It'll be interesting, but you know what? A lot of this, you guys, is not about telling you to draw this way, but to give you this experience to see what it would be like. Because a lot of people would not normally draw hands that look like this. Like I would guess if you guys do a Google search for hand drawings, you're not gonna see poses like this. You're gonna see poses that are very generic across the board, they're all gonna look the same. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the reference photos is give you guys something a little bit more spicy. So that way you are challenged to try something very different. Art Prof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify. And also on iTunes, we would love it if you guys would leave us a rating and a review. And please join me in Discord. I will be over there in about two minutes in the post live streams channel. Would love to hear how you guys might see foreshortening differently, what you learned during the stream, or maybe you gained some art history knowledge along the way. <laughs> Uh, please subscribe to the Art Prof YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who keep Art Prof up and running. Thank you to everybody for coming to the live stream and for supporting all of my little indulgences in the name of art education. I was up so late last night because I was like, oh, I just got to watch that clip again. That was just, that was just really nice the way he just waved his arm that way. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.